grade school. Hi, how's it going? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Is everything working? I'm still very nervous about my new broadcasting setup. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. It's Grade School Friday. I'm excited to be with you guys. We have some meaty topics to cover today, don't we? I'm not sure how deep we can get into how, how deep we could get into just one of these in an hour, but we're going to try to get ultra deep into two uh, in the next hour. So I'm super excited. We're talking about color spaces and exposing to the right. It's going to be a blast. My buddy Godali's here with me. What's going on, Godali? Oh, good morning. What's happening with you, my friend? Tell me what's good uh, in the world. Well, let's see. What's good? Uh, I have some exciting stuff going on with my film, which is nearly done. Um, very excited for that to be nearly ready. And uh, I went to Cinegear last week and saw a whole bunch of tech that's fun to play with. So, you know. Fun. Get out on, on movie stuff. Did you check out the new FSI monitor? I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't get as much time there as I wanted, but I did check the specs online and I saw the mixing light thing. Um, but I, I did. I was able to see a couple other. Yeah, we got to we got to get a demo unit in here at CKC. That thing sounds super cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it looks like it's going to fill a much needed gap. Yep. Um, well, cool. We're um, getting a couple of notes saying that the audio is low, that your volume isn't great. Well, Mine I was choppy, which we don't care about as much. But yeah, I, I, I was low voicing you guys a little bit at the beginning. So hopefully this is just a matter of that because it looks like my signal's nice and nice and healthy in my 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 fancy software based uh, broadcast room. So fingers crossed everyone can hear me OK. I'm, I'm, I'm loath to start speaking even louder than I normally do. But if I got to I will let us know if it gets better or if it still continues to be tough to hear me. Um, I feel like I have things to announce, but they're slipping my mind at the moment. So they can't be that important. They'll come back to me. I'm having a fun week. I don't know how you guys are doing. Things are good for me. I'm color grading. I'm working on uh, a couple of really fun projects and uh, also working on uh, a couple of tools and uh, kind of geeky color science pursuits as I always am that I'm enjoying myself with. Um, I'm reading a book that a friend got for me that I highly recommend for anybody who's creative, which is all of us in this room. Uh, it's Rick Rubin's book. It's called The Creative Act. Uh, it's really, really cool. Uh, easy read, so recommend that. And that's it for me. I hope you guys are doing great. I hope you've had a chance to build up lots of questions uh, for today's topics because there are a couple of good ones. Um, let's put it to the room. We got questions out there yet? We're getting a couple. Um, I think I want to first one wondering about actually this is just a question. I'm going to answer my own question. Um, where in the uh, in the pipeline would you put um, if you're exposing to the right and you're doing a show lot and you want to expose uh, one stop differently, where would you put that in your show lot in the pipeline? And then when you're grading, where would you put that one stop difference? That pull. Oh, that's a great place to kick off exposing to the right. So hopefully everyone can uh, now hear me as well as Gadali nice and clear. But uh, for uh, just in case, I'll repeat the question. Basically, if we're talking about exposing to the right uh, and uh, uh, about basically using a show LUT to help motivate or to give proper context for a production team to expose to the right, and then we are going to receive footage that has been exposed to the right, where in the sequence should both of those things come? It's a great question. So let's a two-parter, obviously. Let's talk about the first part. Let's talk about when we are building our show LUT and what we want to do. Let's say Cullen is building a show LUT for you know Project X, and I want to create a show LUT that in addition to imparting whatever creative character I want it to do, whatever else I want it to do, I want it to cause my cinematographer to expose everything one stop brighter than they normally would. Does that make sense? That's kind of my parameter. So let's go in and build out that show LUT. Uh, so I'm going to, let's do this. I'm just going to wipe out uh, or bypass all my color management and I'm going to zero out my grade here. And what we're going to do is, uh, let's make sure I've got everything back to zero. Okay, good. So what we're going to do is we're going to build out basically the pipeline of the um, of the show LUT and uh, take it from there. So we're going to go like so. Can I'm going to... Oh yeah, let me turn that on. 
let's see here. There we go. All right, I'm just gonna turn off all my color management for now. It should already be off. And why am I still seeing a normalized image? It should not be. Let's just do this. There we go. So we're gonna build a show let, and let's just say we're gonna do a full pipeline going through DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. Like so. So I'm gonna do a CST, we'll do a a pair of CSTs. By the way, if anyone hasn't seen this before, this will be kind of a fun exercise. I'm basically going to build out in nodes the color management that we normally do in our project settings. So we're starting from Airy Wide Gamut 3, Airy Log C3. That is the color space of my camera moving into my standard working color space. I'm then going to go to this side and we're going to go from our working color space of DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate, out to Rec 7 or 9, Gamut 2.4. I'll set my tone mapping to luminance and do my customs like I like to do. Saturation compression on, forward OOTF on, and I'm going to label these things as well. We're going to go 2709, and we're going to say in. So if we were to go in right now and right click on this thumbnail and go to generate LUT and say 33 point cube, this right here would be a very boring but correct and effective viewing LUT for using on set, right? This is gonna take me from, uh, hang on one second, guys. Hey, hey, Dixie, sorry, my dog is going crazy. Dixie, come here, please. Thank you. Lay down, Dixie. Okay, where were we? So if I were to generate this as a LUT right now, I would have a very boring but correct viewing LUT for my Alexa to view in Rec. 7 or 9 on my monitor, okay? So what would we do from here if we we're talking about getting our exposed to the right? Well, let's do two things. Let's go ahead and say that we're trying to get some sort of look in there. So we're going to throw one of my essentials into the mix, something from my Voyager Essentials pack here. And we'll just throw Nelvana in there. And maybe we want it at 50% strength. So now we would have a viewing LUT with some creative character cooked into it as well, right? So we're well on our way. Now what do we want to do? Now we want to build in a pull of one stop of exposure into this LUT, which will cause the production team to have to hit the sensor with one stop of light in order to make up the difference, right? So the original question, where should we place that? We want to place that here in our working space, of course, not in our camera space and not in our display space. And we want to place it upstream of any creative parameters. So that would place it right here. Basically, the first thing that you would do before any creative or curve operations, or uh, you would do it at a minimum before any other kind of creative curve based operations that are going to move you out of a photometric metric for your image. So in this case, what I could do is just go in and for example, go to my HDR global wheel and go minus one. Or if I wanted to do it with linear gain, I could go gamma, linear, go back over to my gain and set my gain to a 0.5, which is one times two to the power of one, or rather one divided by two to the power of one, 0.5, one stop of exposure, okay? So that's where I would place it there. And if you were to cook this, you would now have a show lot, which is gonna take you from your camera space, put you out to your display space, take you in between through uh, the look imparted by this ingredient from the Voyager uh, Essentials Pack, and along the way, pull one stop of uh, exposure. What's that gonna do? That's gonna mean that if they wanna get their image on set looking like this, they're going to have to hit this image with a stop of extra exposure. So you can see if I'm in my linear gain here, and I hit this with one stop of exposure, which would be one times two to the power of one, now I'm getting a healthy image again. And in fact, these two null each other out. They cancel each other out. So that's part one. Where do we place that in the show lot? Basically, just make sure you put it in your working space so that you can easily, uh, so that it's uh, easiest to deal with and make sure that you are doing it before anything that's altering your tone curve so that you are still in a net linear uh, sort of uh, relationship for uh, your shadows, highlights, and midtones. Okay. And then when it comes to actually grading, once you receive this overexposed footage back, it kind of becomes dealer's choice there, but I would say if you want to grade your image in a familiar way, the simplest thing would be simply to pull that stop at the very head of the node graph. Because 
the image at that point is the image. So it's not really going to change the way how easy or difficult it is to work with the image. It's just going to mean that you have a more robust image because it has been pushed further off of the noise floor. So simplest and probably correct in virtually all cases would be just within your node graph. We're now back within like, let's say like we're back within a normal color managed environment. Like I always suggest here on the channel, I'm just going to quickly build that back out. And we're, we're grading uh, material that we've received back from that production that used our show lot. And all we want to know is, well, where should we do that exposure poll? You should just do it. You know, if we go to our stock node tree here, we've got a basic node tree that we usually use here on the channel. And you could either do it in your exposure node, or if you wanted, you could make this kind of like a initial adjustment at the very head and just go in, do gamma linear and then set your gain down to a 0.5 like so, and then grade absolutely normally, never once again, ne ne never at any point again, think about the fact that this was exposed to the right and just benefit from the fact that you're gonna have a cleaner and more robust signal. Long answer, but hopefully that gives you some good detail on how to approach that in the creation of a show lot and in grading material that has been explicitly exposed, in this case, one stop to the right, uh, and sort of like how to set that up and then how to think about it when you're actually going through both of those processes. All right, uh, let's see. Question from Sesco. Um, can you go over the uh, an overview of why you would choose a wider color space for color grading if you're watching in Rec. 709 and that's all your monitor can display? Oh, yeah. I feel like I've had uh, a good opportunity now at least twice in recent grade schools to revisit an analogy that I really liked that we came up with here on the show, uh, maybe late last year about the jar of peanut butter. Does anybody remember my jar of peanut butter analogy? Well, I won't give you the full monologue that I delivered then uh, about peanut butter, but essentially when I have my uh, fresh jar of peanut butter, when I open it up and I'm very excited because I love peanut butter and I've got the new jar opened up, I have to mix my peanut butter because it's like, uh, it, it's, it's like, you know, just peanuts, basically just peanuts and salt. So it's, it doesn't have anything in there to kind of keep it all together. So you have to mix the oil and the peanut stuff itself because it kind of gets separated and I don't like doing it it's really frustrating to me because my jar of peanut butter is perfectly large enough for the peanut butter itself, but what it is not large enough for is mixing those two things together, especially those first two critical like stirs of the peanut butter. If I'm not exceptionally careful, I end up spilling oil over the side of the jar because the jar is really not large enough for me to mix and move around its contents. It is only large enough to store the contents as long as they don't move at all, okay? That's my analogy for why we want to grade in a larger color space than the color space for which we are mastering. If we kind of like put a, uh, you know, like some tangibles on that real fast, let's go ahead and return to a color managed image here. Let's make sure my input color space is area log C3, which it is. Let's, let's remove this one stop pull that we were doing. And let's say for the sake of argument, Let's put it this way. Let's say that we are grading. I'm trying to think of the easiest way to sketch this out. I want to grade in Rec. 7 or 9, basically. One way I could do this would be to set my timeline color space to Rec. 7 or 9, Gamma 2, 4, like so, and set my input DRT to luminance mapping, like so. So what happened when I just saved that? Nothing. It's still, to the, the, the point of the question, we're still getting out to Rec. 7 or 9, so what does it really matter how we got there or when we make that move to Rec. 7 or 9 and whether it happens before or after we do our color grading? Here's what's gonna happen. Just like in my uh, example with the jar of peanut butter, the moment I go to adjust exposure, first of all, I can't adjust exposure using things like linear gain anymore because I'm not in that kind of domain, but if I go to adjust exposure or contrast, I'm immediately gonna spill through the bottom of my peanut butter jar, if that makes sense, because my color space is large enough for all of the pixels in the image as they exist right now, but it is not any larger. There's no headroom. There's no room around the image for me to manipulate things in. At least I can't count on there being that room because if I have an image that is using some or all of the Rec. 7 or 9 gamut, then there's no room to spare. I can't move left. I can't move right. I can't move up or down without uh, 
bumping into the boundary of the color space and getting clipping. So it's an uncomfortable, almost claustrophobic feeling if you're used to grading in DaVinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate. And that's maybe the best uh, answer that I could give you to this question is to do exactly what I just did. Set up your color management using the stock uh, settings that I recommend here on the channel. And great, play around, turn your exposure, push your balance, try that on maybe five different images, and then flip over and do what I just did here. Set your timeline color space to match your output color space and set your input DRT to luminance mapping. What you're gonna find is that the baseline rendering is identical. It doesn't change at all, but what you are also going to find if you go and you grade those same five to 10 images is you're gonna feel like you're bumping into walls everywhere you turn because your container color space, your working color space does not necessarily have any more room than the uh, contents of the image itself. So just like my peanut, my peanut butter jar, you're gonna end up getting peanut oil spilling out over the side, which is very upsetting because as I mentioned in my uh, original uh, uh, talk about the peanut butter jar, you have technically less peanut butter than you did before, and that's a tragedy. Okay, question, um, let's see. If exposing to the right is to move away from the noise floor and camera, what? how do you deal with uh, highlights clipping in camera? If exposing to the right is to move away from the noise floor and the camera, how do you deal with highlights clipping? You know, this is a great question. And here, here's the reality, guys. When we're talking about anything, whether we are talking about, you know, like probiotics in your diet here, I've look, I'm, I'm already two for two food analogies and we're only 20 minutes into the show. Uh, let's see how many I can get to by the end. Whether we're talking about probiotics in your diet or uh, about like any addition to your color grading practice, Everything is a matter of degrees, right? Everything is shaded. When I tell you exposing to the right is a sound uh, technique for getting a cleaner image, there's such thing as taking that advice too far, right? If I take an Advil for a headache, that's great. If I take 10 Advil for a headache, that's not great. That's a terrible idea, right? So how do you know where in between one Advil and 10 Advil you should plot when you have a headache? Well, unfortunately, you can either go off of what the bottle tells you or you kind of have to experiment, right? Thankfully, we're not gambling with our lives and with our health when we are talking about exposing to the right. And thankfully, we can test ahead of time for our shoot. So how do we strike the ideal balance between reaching the ceiling of the dynamic range of our sensor and the effective floor? Notice I say effective floor because the theoretical floor of any sensor is zero because if you send it zero image, it will capture or send it zero stimulus, it will capture zero light. But the reality is there's a point above that floor where you're really not capturing dynamic pixels anymore. You're really not capturing the scene anymore. So how do you find where your sweet spot is in between those where, okay, if I expose my middle gray at X and uh, I you know, expose it there, do I have the optimal amount of dynamic range below and above that point for my needs and for the needs of this project? That's definitely a matter of testing. So how do you know when you've gone too far other than testing? You really don't. I would say the rule of thumb for me, what I often uh, remind uh, my production counterparts of in these conversations is I might get one project a month, maybe one project a month where I'm like, ugh, you really blew out that exposure. And now the skin tones are like, like some of them are actually clipped out and they're gummed up to the ceiling and I can't really pull it in and it feels kind of flat and weird up there. I might get one of those projects a month. Virtually every project that I, I won't say every project, a far greater number of the projects that I grade suffer from having been exposed lower than would have been ideal. I'm not going to say underexposed because the image looks perfectly fine, but in our exposed to the right video, uh, we all observed, hey, even an 800 ISO, like perfectly well exposed image actually looks better if I expose it to the right. So it's not a simple question of like, oh, you underexposed it, you blew it, you gotta get it right next time. It's a question of the advantage and whether the sweet spot for where we wanna expose our image is exactly at the spec or whether we could actually benefit from uh, exposing a bit more to the right than that. So that's a balancing act that we have to strike. But I would say in general, we tend to fall on the left-hand side of it. We tend to expose too far to the left and far more rarely do we expose too far to the right and end up with problems in that area. Usually the problems are with the noise floor rather than with the uh, ceiling of uh, the sensor, at least in my uh, individual experience as a colorist. Question from Diego. 
can you uh, go over how you do the bonometric increase and decrease of exposure with the nodes in your video? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in those nodes in the video, that's uh, exactly what we just did uh, in our experiment here today. I'm literally using linear gain to do it. So if I just reset my exposure node here and I set my gamma to linear, this means that the relationship between my uh, pixels as they get brighter or darker is one to one to what their relationship is out here in the real world. So if I want to make everything in the image twice as bright, then I do that by setting my gain to a two, which by the way, making everything twice as bright, that is the exact same thing as a stop of exposure. So that's what I'm doing there. And same thing if we wanna do a stop pulled of exposure, we wanna make everything half as bright as it was before, which is what one stop less is, I would set this to a 0.5. The formula for the mathematically inclined among us is input times two to the power of n, where n is the number of stops that you want to add to the image. Or if you want to diminish exposure, reduce exposure, then it would be two divided by, or rather it would be uh, input divided by two to the power of n. Okay, so that's literally all I'm doing is using the uh, gain operator to uh, you know apply the result of that formula. So if I, if I wanted to do a two stop pull, I would say, well, I'm starting at a one on my wheel here. So if I multiply one times two to the power, or rather if I divide one uh, by two to the power of two, that's four, right? What do I get? A 0.25. So setting my gain to 0.25 in linear gamma is effectively pulling two stops of exposure. And by the way, uh, we're gonna be talking about this in an upcoming video, but I have recently confirmed when we look at our HDR global wheel, I've always uh, been under the impression that the tonal adjustment here in the global exposure knob is subject to the same odd behavior as the tonal adjustments in the other wheels here. It's actually not. So if you wanted to make this even simpler, exposure minus one, that's gonna be identical. We can actually prove it right now. Grab a still of this, wipe out that adjustment and set my gain to a 0.5 like so. That's gonna be identical to what I just did in the HDR zones palette. Give me that last little point there. There we go, let's get it like that. Those are gonna be one-to-one -to, -one to each other. So that would be an even easier way potentially of doing it. Just go to that HDR uh, global exposure wheel and just make sure that you've got your color management set up properly because if you don't, then you won't get the right results out of that. But that's a, a summary of how I'm uh, pushing and pulling photometric stops. Someone's asking, I thought, it, I thought it's best to always have a CSD at the end of the node tree. Doesn't setting the transform and the project settings defeat that purpose? Doesn't setting the transform and the project set? Well, un unless you are asking about our example where we are explicitly doing it wrong or doing it different from the way I normally would, where we set the timeline color space to rec 709 gamma 24, no. Uh, I'm glad this question came up because this is, I think, something that is a fairly common misconception. We tend to think that when I set all of this up, that basically all of this happens, start with area logs, uh, log C3, transform to DaVinci wide gamma and intermediate, then transform to rec 709 gamma 24. Often, I won't say oftentimes, but I, I have encountered like a lot of circumstances where we tend to think, oh, all of this happens, everything in between input color space and output color space, and then the image is deposited at the head of the node graph, and then we're grading in rec 709 gamma 24. That's not the case. What we are doing is we are grading in our timeline color space. This is one of the reasons why I much prefer the term working color space to timeline color space, because that makes it explicitly clear that where the grading happens is actually here, not after this. So the grading happens after we've moved from our camera metric into our working space, but it does not happen after we've moved from our working space into our color space. So effectively the CST that uh, if we were to build, build this in nodes, like we actually did a minute ago for our show LUT, the CST in this stack is still happening after everything that we do when we grade. In fact, even at the timeline level, this is why I'm able to do things like use my Voyager Essentials LUTs here at the timeline level, because even when I apply things there, let's zero out that exposure pull, even when I apply things here, I'm still in DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. I actually physically can't access the image 
in its Rec. 7 or 9 state when I am color managing using my project settings. For the most part, that's a good thing. That actually can be problematic for certain workflows, but uh, basically you are always working upstream of that final CST to your display space when you are color managing in your project settings. Um, let's see. Uh, Diego is wondering, regarding color spaces, do you have a description of nuances with how Resolve tools react when they're when working in different color spaces? You know, I would put it to you this way. Here's a good rule of thumb for that because there, there's a lot of I, I, there's a lot of nuance to answering that question ultimately. But what I would say is this: for the most part, in Resolve, other than the HDR zones palette, I'm going to kind of leave that as a cutout. Take all the tools in Resolve and just kind of put the HDR zones palette aside into its own pile. Pretty much all of these other tools were designed with Rec. 709 in mind. Now, in some cases, that doesn't matter at all. Like when we were just doing linear gain on the image, it's not like the black magic engineers came up with the gain operator. The gain operator is as old as electronic engineering. So it's not something novel that they came up with that really only works in Rec. 7 or 9 and doesn't work as well elsewhere. It just so happens that lift gamma gain and offset were devised for operating in a Rec. 7 or 9-ish space, but they really don't work fundamentally better there than they do anywhere else. That's just their original application as uh, it was devised in color correction. There are other tools, however, things like the qualifier, things like your hue versus hue curves, or even your custom curves, or your loom versus sat curves. That's another uh, great example. They're designed to work in Rec. 7 or 9. So a simple sort of like generalized uh, bit of wisdom that we can observe about this is that the larger our color space gets, the further away from Rec. 7 or 9 it gets, the less ideal tools like this become. So that's really the only like overall statement I feel like I can make about like, well, here's how the tools and adjustments differ between color space A and B. The difference is really going to come down to how far is color, how far away from Rec. 7 or 9 is color space A, and how far, how far away from Rec. 7 or 9 is color space B. If color space B is like P3 and color space A is like Aces AP0, to make an extreme example, color space B is generally going to feel more intuitive and behave more uh, intuitively than color space A will. That's really the only top level rule of thumb that I can think of there. And I, I say all of that, uh, I should say all of that with the caveat that in general, like the tools in Resolve are all gonna work fine regardless of your color space. They're just gonna have different response and sensitivities. But uh, the broad sort of uh, rule of thumb there would be that the further from Rec. 709 you go, the less of a designed response you're gonna get from the tools because they really were designed for the most part with a Rec. 7 or 9 display referred kind of color grading paradigm in mind. Um, what else? Have we solved the mysteries of the universe? Nearly. Um, let's see. G is wondering, uh, should a DP always uh, expose to the right or just when the lighting environment is not bright enough? Oh, I'm, th this is a great question. Should we always expose to the right? And that leads me immediately to another question. If we should always expose to the right, and if there's some constant factor by which we should expose to the right, shouldn't we just call that exposing to the middle? It's an interesting question, right? Here's what I think about that. Here's what I find interesting. If we sort of like, I, this is a sweater thread that like I started pulling on years ago of like, wait, what, what is this? Exposed to the right? How do I know where to expose? Middle gray, what is middle gray? Where did that come from? Like, and I just started exploring and, and pulling this apart. If we pull that thread all the way to its, uh, to its end and we figure out, okay, what's lying at the basis of what is exposing to the middle? Because if we say, should we expose to the right? What we're really saying is exposed to the middle is not a accurate or uh, correct model for us when we're exposing uh, images. So the question would be, well, what's wrong with that? How did we get to that? Why isn't it right? And the reality is ex exposed to the middle 
is really about hitting 18% linear on our camera sensor, assuming native ISO, okay? Uh, so whatever that might be, 800, 640, doesn't matter. So if you've got your native ISO and you are photographing a mid-gray patch or a person's skin for that matter, and that encodes at an average of 18%, then traditional motion imaging wisdom says that you have a healthy exposed image. The question is, is that true? Is that correct? Or should that actually be like, I don't know, 36% would be one stop over, 72% would be two stops over. Should it be one of those? Should it be somewhere in between? How do we know? And we talked a moment ago about the importance of testing, which I'm such a big believer in, but I'm also a big believer in tethering our testing to measurable things, quantifiable things. So uh, just because I can't help it, I'll leak to you guys that I'm working on a product right now that is designed to give you an intuitive and an accurate connection to what you're actually exposing to mid-gray of your sensor. I'm working on this product uh, right now and it's gonna be out before the year is out for sure. Um, this is, and it's meant as an assist to cinematographers in particular. It's meant to show you unequivocally, where am I actually hitting the sensor with my subject? Is it where I expect or is it somewhere different? So that's number one. And what I'm most excited about, I would say with this tool is like at a baseline, it allows me to, it's something that I can offer up to my clients and basically get the results that we uh, looked at in our exposed to the right video. Where I said, hey, look how much stronger the image is. Look how much lower the noise is when you go one stop to the right or two stops to the right. And if I can give you a tool that allows you to, in a highly calibrated, accurate way, do exactly that, you're gonna bring me better images to grade, I'm gonna give you better images, I'm gonna have more fun, you're gonna like the results more, and round and round we go, things are gonna go in a great direction. So that's really the first intent of the tool, is just to provide a uh, robust tool for doing what I always prescribe to my clients, which is be mindful of your noise floor and push off at least a little bit to the right, uh, unless for some reason you feel it's more important to preserve dynamic range in the highlights, which I think is a dubious claim for a variety of reasons. And we can actually talk about that in a minute as well. So that's uh, the number one intent of this tool. But the other thing I am maybe most excited about with this tool that I'm talking about is it allows me, let's just do a, I'm gonna paint a little picture for you guys because I think it's, it's worth exploring for a second here. If you're my client and I say, hey, I think, let, let's just take for granted that you're gonna get better results or not take for granted. Let's say we've tested and determined that your images just look better for your aesthetic that you're after, for the uh, types of scenery that you're gonna be shooting. If we overexpose everything by one stop, if we go, if we optimize for 36% middle gray as opposed to 18%. So we build that into the show let like we looked at a couple minutes ago. You go out, you gather your images, you shoot it that whole way and we bring it back into the grading suite and as we're going through and shot by shot grading, we start to determine like, hey, we actually feel like in some cases it's all fine but maybe we actually didn't need to put that much more light onto the sensor. Maybe we only needed three quarters of a stop or two thirds of a stop or a half of a stop, whatever the case may be. What's fun is that we're no longer in the realm of having to feel our way through that. And on the next shoot, I can say, okay, I'm gonna give you a uh, tool that allows you to optimize for two thirds over as opposed to one full stop over. And we can actually tether our subjective visual conclusions to numbers. And in doing so, we can zero in on the exact answer to that question for you, either as a cinematographer or as the cinematographer of a particular project, because I do think that's ultimately the type of granularity that uh, we can benefit from is to say, hey, for this project, for the aesthetic of these creatives, this is the optimal place to expose our subject to on this sensor to really nail all those specifics. And that's something that we can do. It just requires testing and experimentation, and it requires a system where you have explicit numerical feedback about what you're doing so that you can explicitly numerically adjust what you're doing in pursuit of a better outcome. So ultimately, like, how do we decide where to uh, like temper those things and expose those things? I think it's a, a matter of uh, getting granular with it. And only at that point, after doing Maybe you do 10 projects and you've had the chance to really calibrate and dial in. You go, hey, I've found over the course of now doing 10 projects with Cullen that pretty invariably I really like 24% middle gray. And now you're not taking a legacy 18% number, which is completely arbitrary and made up and dates back to newspaper, if you can believe it. Now you've got a number that you have authored, that you've controlled, and you've said, hey, 
based on empirical testing over multiple projects, this is where I love to see my images exposed to, and it gives me lots of room. My colorist loves it. And unless uh, evidence comes in that proves otherwise, this is my stock default position for middle gray, as opposed to some arbitrary uh, metric from another century. Question from Marcelo. Do you prefer managing uh, per project color space? Uh, prefer managing color spaces per project or using IDT per clip at the clip level if you have mixed color spaces in the same timeline? I assume we're asking fundamentally if, if I prefer to color manage using nodes or project settings, uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly. For me, in, in most cases, I prefer to color manage using nodes um, simply because I've, I've probably talked about this here in grade school before. Wow, that image looks kind of zany, doesn't it? There we go. Um, I've probably talked about this in grade school here before, but there's a feature that I really like in Baselight called Color Space Journey that allows you at, at a single click on any image to see the entire journey of my image. So like, hey, what the heck is happening to this thing? Because what I'm doing in the grade is just one piece of it. What's the IDT? What's the ODT? Are there looks in line? What other pieces are in line in between camera negative and what I'm getting when I go out the door to my display? That's a really easy thing to do in Baselight. It's a click away. You can see what is the journey of this specific clip uh, anytime you want to. In Resolve, there is no such feature. And in fact, the closest we can get to such a feature is to color manage in nodes so that, you know, if I just like very quickly build that back out here, I'm going to go back to DaVinci YRGB for my color science and I'm going to set uh, an IDT uh, of log C3 and I'm going to set an ODT of Rec 7 or 9, like so. So now, when I'm color managing in nodes, by the way, I'm looking at the exact same image I was looking at a moment ago when I was color managing in my project settings. I'm just doing it in nodes now. And if I want to know the color space journey of this image, I can pretty quickly figure it out by going like, oh, okay, there's an input transform here that's taking me from Airy to DaVinci Wide Gamut. There's grading happening here at the clip level, whatever the colorist is doing. There's something that may be happening here if it's a member of a group or things are happening at this level. Not always something happening there, and in this case, there's nothing. And finally, there is a look in place here, and there is a transform out to Rec. 7 or 9 from DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. So it's an easy way for me to follow that flow, especially in cases like uh, you described in your question about like, oh, well, we've actually got multiple cameras. It's really easy for me to see the journey of camera A versus B versus C. So I've done it both ways, but in general, I like having the nodes that make up the color space journey kind of like foregrounded and more visible to me just so that I can uh, check them very easily at any point and see it confirmed very plainly right there in the CST. You're starting here and you are going there. You can effectively confirm the same thing by looking at your color management settings and then looking at your input color space. Uh, I just find it to be a little bit more abstracted. Um, let's see, question from Wary. If linear gain is photometric for exposure, what about contrast and balance? Ooh, that's a juicy question. If that's our photometric baseline, what about contrast and color balance? It's not quite so cut and dry there. The closest thing that you could really do to getting a photometric uh, contrast adjustment, let's start with contrast, by my measure would be to uh, hit your ratio node here with linear contrast and pivot, which is why here in my project settings, I typically have use S curve for contrast turned off so that I can get contrast and pivot that is pure linear in nature. And if I set my pivot to the mid gray of my system, 0.336, I'm now adding or reducing neutral contrast in the sense that I am pivoting around middle gray or that I'm not changing middle gray, if that makes sense. So that is not exact. I can't tell you with a straight face that is purely photometric because if I were to hit the sensor in the first place with a higher contrast ratio, I can't guarantee that it would have been this tidy or this linear in terms of the sensor's response. But I do think this is a sensible photographic photographically minded way of imparting contrast into your image. Another way that you can think about it, this is something else that I uh, do in my 
grades all the time. We've talked about it here on the channel. If I pull out a DaVinci Wide Gamut Gray plot here or patch, and I go over here to my custom curves and I sample, this is looking kind of funky because I've got, I put this in my parallel path. Let's just do it over here. And I go into my custom curves and I make a sample of that patch like so. I'm just going to tap command C and go to node four and tap command V now. And I can wipe out this patch because I no longer need it. Now I've got custom curves with an anchor point at the mid gray of my system. Something else that you can do if, for example, you want to add fill light. Let's just reset this node actually. If you want to add fill light in a kind of photometric way, this would be a pretty sensible way of doing that because you are constraining this curve adjustment to mid gray. So nothing at or above mid gray is going to be uh, affected by what you do here. And you're also leaving your deepest shadows where they are. So you're not picking those up or dropping them down. So this is, I would say similarly, I can't tell you with a straight face, this is strictly photometric, but it is a sensible uh, way, a photographic minded way of introducing or extracting contrast from the image. That's two principles that we can think about on the contrast side. And then on the balance side, we can think about this in a couple of different ways. You know, like one, one way that we can think about this would be to use a color model such as the LMS model, which is uh, designed to mimic the long, medium and short responses in our eyes. That would be one option there. Another one would be one that we've, again, talked about here on the channel of just using linear gain, linear, uh, yeah, setting our gamma linear and doing the same thing that we do for exposure just with our balance where we are at least affecting. This is basically changing the response of the sensor so that you could think of this again as sort of faux photometric or photographically minded in the sense that you are very cleanly linearly altering the ratio of red to green to blue in the image. I really like doing this for a variety of reasons. And I also would say in my experience, this is as close to any uh, adjustment that uh, I've auditioned in my uh, experimentation to giving you something that feels anchored in a sort of naturalistic and photographic mode of adjusting things. It's not the only thing you could uh, audition for, uh, you know, like satisfying that purpose of getting a photometric adjustment, but I think it's a really uh, sensible one. It's a really simple one. It's really robust. It doesn't break. So uh, all, all high votes of confidence for me on that front. So really short answer uh, to abbreviate that very long answer I gave linear gain for exposure, uh, linear contrast pivot in your ratio and or an anchored custom curve for uh, controlling contrast and then linear gain uh, for your balance as well are all very sensible sort of photographically oriented means of uh, manipulating your image, even if they are not one to one giving you a photographic manipulation or photometric manipulation of what you would have gotten by changing uh, the stimulus that is hitting the sensor. Question from Ecto. When I use the HSV saturation method with the gamma wheel, I've noticed a lot of noise artifacts being introduced, but the gain wheel is better, but still some noise after some push. Thoughts with how to deal with that or why that might be happening? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, the let, let's just explore that for a second here. So let's say we want to do some HSV style sat here. In general, you know, like, first of all, let, let's just observe that pretty much any knob in resolve if you hit it hard enough you're going to get noise and artifacting right like if i just take my uh you know like saturation knob if i go hard enough i'm gonna get artifacts right like i've got weird stuff happening here in the image it's getting noisier at a certain point uh, usually your taste will intervene before uh the image starts to break but you know like you can you're gonna get that you're going to get those kind of problems. Like if you hit any knob hard enough. Now, if we're talking about doing things in HSV, I'm going to limit myself down to channel two here. And if we look at why is it, let's start by answering a good question. Why is it that I, t I feel like I'm getting more artifacts, more noise when I adjust my gamma than when I adjust my gain? Well, easiest way probably to think about that would be if we just do a gamma adjustment on this image, just a normal vanilla gamma adjustment, look at what happens as we crank this up. This happens to be a pretty clean image. Let's go to like, I don't know, something with a little more shadow to it. And let's also turn off our 
whatever insanity is happening on this image to make it misbehave. Oh, there we go. There we go. It's because I keep flip-flopping in between two different color managing in nodes versus color managing in project settings. Do I have this turned back on here? No. Oh, my camera raw settings? Yeah. So I need to set my camera raw to deep bayer in the proper way since I'm currently color managing in nodes. So I'm going to tell this manually to do red wide gamut RGB, log 3G10, bit depth of 16, and to pay attention to the ISO and color temp as conceived by the cinematographer. And now I can go back to my Rec 709 output transform. And I can turn off my input transform. Or actually, no, I want that. This should be a member of the red group. You guys are getting a little glimpse into the way that I will color manage when I'm using uh, notes as opposed to project settings. Basically, uh, one of the big differences is with camera raw media, you actually need to designate your uh, the way that that material is being debayered in your color grade. So this should all be correct now. And something still feels funky overall here. That's all correct. I wonder if that's been taken over in some extreme way. That's all correct. Let's just go back to my Oh, this metadata curves thing could be, there we go. Someone was partying with the metadata curves. That's actually a great little side mission for everyone to be aware of. If you are color managing in notes and you, as a result, are needing to explicitly set your camera raw settings to debayer into the color space that you want, which in this case would be red wide gamut RGB log 3G10, you can have some operators and cinematographers will actually apply curves in the camera to like mess with the image and get what they're looking for. All due respect to cinematographers who like to mess around with this. If I can't do a level job or a better job of what they did in Resolve, I probably shouldn't be hired as the colorist. So my take is that I don't generally want that to be cooked into my starting point and I'll turn it off. And it's also something that can give you kind of an odd starting point like we saw here a moment ago. Like, don't love that. That feels weird, right? So something you can go in and just double check and turn off usually unless you have specific reason to want to leave it on. Um, now then, where were we? We were talking about gamma in SAT once upon a time. So what I wanted to do was just do an exploration of like opening up gamma on this image. And you can see like the noisiest parts of the image, the dark portions of the image where there's low signal strength. When I gamma up, those are the things that are becoming visible. I'm really increasing the image in those areas because if we remember from our video uh, that we looked at this week, gamma, let's turn these output transforms off. Gamma is boosting. We're getting a boost in the bottom end of the image, right? So we're really driving low values up high. So that's a long winded way of referencing back to the original question about HSV saturation. What's happening when we see noise, when we add gamma HSV sat to our image, is that we are driving up very low saturation values. We are near, you could think of this as the noise floor of our uh, saturation. Now oh, I should have put these into separate groups here. Let's do that. You could think of it as the, the noise floor of your saturation channel. You are driving those values pretty strongly up when you turn your gamma. And the more you turn your gamma, the more you're going to be driving those values up. So that's why you are going to tend to see more noise, more artifacting when you flip into HSV here and you twist your gamma to the right uh, than when you twist your game. Now, there's a balance there because this is also one of the reasons why gamma why applying gamma to your sat channel is such a fun idea because oftentimes when we want to saturate, we want to saturate stuff that's not very saturated, right? We typically don't want to saturate the stuff that's already super saturated sometimes, but often not. So there's a balance to be struck there where like you don't want to drive it too far. It's definitely 
possible to get artifacts or problems, but it's also a great way to get a really nice looking image. So that's why you're gonna see noise, artifacting, tearing, uh, gamma-ing up your sat sooner than you will with your gain. And in general, the reason you're gonna see that uh, even with your gain is that's just the nature of uh, increasing a saturation channel beyond a certain point, is at a certain point you are just compounding or increasing or drawing out the noise in that channel as opposed to the actual robust meat of that channel. Same thing as any other portion. It's it's uh, very analogous to over to like exposing an image up too far or like trying to flatten out or open up some dark portion of the image. If there's nothing in there, if there's just noise in there, all you are doing is bringing more noise to the surface. So it's a long answer, but that would be kind of what I would think about there. Some of that's inevitable. Drive any knob hard enough, you're gonna have a problem. And gamma is going to do it sooner than gain because gamma is grabbing at those low values where the noisy stuff is going to be uh, more resident than uh, in the top end. Uh, let's see. Red cameras do a highlight recovery in IPv2. When is it good to expose to the right to that range? And when should I avoid those recovered stops? Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't done a robust, uh, like, test on the highlight recovery thing in red. And it doesn't look like it's part of the SDK to modulate that in any way. Compared with, like, B-RAW, where you actually can tell it, do that highlight recovery or don't. But here's what I would say, guys. Again, like there's no substitute for testing. So there's no answer I can give you. And there's no one who can give you an answer that is one size fits all. But there's a huge area in between. Cool. You're way off the noise floor. You've got a really, really clean, robust bottom end of your image. And oh, damn, you're actually starting to drive important pixels up into that area where highlights are going to be clipped or mistreated because they're so close to the ceiling of the sensor. There's a huge range in there by design. Like that's the big claim. Like when red tells me like, you know, we get whatever, like 25 plus stops or whatever they're claiming. I don't know if it's really that many, but you know, whenever I hear that marketing speak about like, we've got all these stops in there. I don't personally place much stock in like, oh, that must be true. It must really be that number of stops. But what I do hear when I hear that and when I look at footage from a red or from an area or wherever is, this is exactly what I want. There's tons of dynamic range in here. So I would say in general, I think we are underestimating how much dynamic range we have in the meat of the sensor where we really don't need to worry at all about the noise floor or about the uh, highlight ceiling where we've just got linear clean response in the sensor. There's tons of dynamic range in there. If there weren't, then these cameras really wouldn't be worth using. So uh, again, no substitute for testing and it is possible to take too many Advil, take too many probiotics, expose too far to the right. But in general, just because you push two stops off of the floor, I don't think you now need to be going like, oh geez, what if I'm bumping into the ceiling of the sensor? It's gonna take more than that. You're gonna have to push it harder or hit it with an exceptionally bright scene in order to really start uh, bringing in the ceiling of the sensor as a major factor that you then need to compensate for. Would be my general take there. Question from John. How do you work with texture and do you use compressed shadows? Oh, two interesting questions. Yeah, so here's what I would say with texture. I feel like I've talked about base light a couple times today. I'll just go ahead and leak to you guys. I am base light curious. I'm a big fan of the base light platform and, and you may see some more base light uh, coming into play here on the channel and uh, I know I won't say I know. You can you can bet that you're uh, that it's going to find its way into uh, the client facing side of my color grading business as well. There's a lot of interesting tools uh, in Baselight. One of which, high on the list for me, is the tools that allow you to manipulate the texture of an image because they just feel good to me. Today, as a Resolve user, texture is something that I work with on a very limited basis, simply because as an artist, I don't feel that I have tools that give me results that I like. Uh, so forget, it's not even something that I'm putting in front of my clients and they're going, ah, no, I don't want that, get rid of it. It's something for the most part, the texture tools available to me in Resolve, I generally shy away from because I don't love what they do. Kind of on paper, they work and they do the tasks that they're assigned to do, but the feeling of the result of something like mid-tone detail or the uh, texture pop, is that what it's called? 
Let me make sure I'm not crazy. Yeah, texture pop. Um, I don't love like the feeling of those manipulations, so I generally will shy away from them. Um, if I had a better tool, I would think about texture more and use it more. The other side of the coin there, grain, uh, those of you guys who've hung out with me here in grade school or in the channel uh, in general uh, for a while, know that I'm not a huge fan of grain. Uh, that is something that clients ask me about and request, and when they do, I'm happy to put it in there. But I'm not a huge fan of grain, especially if it's in pursuit of like getting the so-called film look. Um, my big reference for this, the, the, my, my gold standard uh, in a lot of ways, is uh, the work of Roger Deakins and the way that his work changed and didn't change when he transitioned over to shooting uh, on Airy digital cameras many years ago. There is no attempt in any of Roger Deakins' cinematography that I can recollect where they are trying to maintain the texture and the grain of film because I, without having asked him about this personally, my sense is that Deakins sees grain as film engineers used to see grain, which is fundamentally a problem that we want to mitigate. So I'm not a big fan of grain. It's not something I go out of my way to do. It's not something that I introduce a lot into my projects. It's something that I try to uh, shy away from, if anything. And the other side of like just manipulating the softness or sharpness of various regions of the image, I don't feel I have the ideal tool set for, tool set for that yet. And then maybe the last thing that I'll add in there in terms of texture uh, would be um, that I do have a good recipe that I really like for doing halation, just like a soft bloom, a soft warm bloom in specular highlights in an image. That is something that I like to do that I often will do uh, just to take that kind of biting linear edge uh, out of uh, the top end of an image sometimes. Uh, so that is one that I do play with that I do break out uh, quite a bit. And then the second part of the question, do I uh, compress shadows or work with compressed shadows? Yes, 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 absolutely. Big, big fan of, of sculpting and rewriting and uh, re and like shaping shadows. I feel like so much of the life of an image and the way it feels and looks and tastes has to do with that journey from middle exposure down to the floor and how gently we make that descent. Uh, so I'm a big fan of uh, compressing as a sort of like general top level term, but just uh, in more detail, really, really shaping that uh, descent from mid gray all the way down to zero. And we get time for one more. Okay. Um... Let's see. Question from uh, Yasin. Uh, you you talk about non-resolved tools when it comes to look dev. What are the, some of those tools? Yeah, non-resolved tools when it comes to look dev. Most of those tools in my color grading practice are custom tools that I have developed that either work within Resolve or sometimes not. Uh, sometimes those are scripts or other things that I will create uh, in programs like Nuke um, or uh, in other like pieces of software that will produce a LUT that I can then bring into Resolve. A produ they'll produce a LUT that does a particular thing that I can incorporate into a stack and Resolve. I would say more commonly, I do try to bring non-Resolve tools into Resolve by custom scripting the mathematics if I'm able to with uh, something like DCTL. So a lot of that uh, for me, more and more of it, I'm happy to say in the last couple of years, of the, that non-resolved tool set has become custom DCTLs that can in fact be used within Resolve. Uh, it's just that they're not native to uh, Resolve. They're things that I've had to develop and that are proprietary to currently my company. Though, since the question came up, I will also leak to you guys, there will be a look dev product coming out from me before the year is out that allows you to do really robust, really intuitive, really simple look development right within the Resolve color page, but with all the advantage of those non-Resolve tools that I talk about from time to time here on the channel. Don't have all the details of that yet, and I'm excited to share more with you guys in the very near future, but that is something that we are working on. It is something that I feel every single colorist deserves and is entitled to. You should have a robust look dev toolkit right within Resolve, and if you're willing to learn the discipline of LookDev, you should have the tools to support that craft available to you right within Resolve. That's something that we're going to be facilitating before the year is out with details to come, but it's uh, something I'm super excited about because we should all have access to those tools if we're willing to learn how to use them. And that's a great place to land for today. Um, we got to talk about a bunch of cool stuff. You guys are awesome. Thanks for bringing your excitement, your energy, your questions, your passion into grade school. I love spending this hour with you guys on Friday mornings. Uh, so thank you, uh, as always, for joining. 
Thanks to my buddy Gadali for co-hosting. I hope you'll have an awesome rest of your Friday and an awesome weekend. And I'll see you next week here on the channel. Everybody take care.